Have you ever wondered why there are so many game remasters coming out today? If your first thought was money, you'd be half right. Game publishers love lower risk projects like remasters where the audience for the product they're investing in already exists. But the prevalence of remasters today can also be directly traced back to changes the games industry saw during its seventh and eighth generations. Today, we're going to explore why video game remasters have become commonplace, the methods used by developers to create these updated versions, and why video games blur the line between remaster and remake. This is how video game remasters are made. Before we talk about the true nature of video game remasters, we first have to understand the fundamental differences between remasters of games and remasters of works in other mediums. So, what is a remaster. Master and remaster are terms derived from the music and film industries. A master is the final version of a work from which the copies that we experience are based off of. It's the song you hear, or the movie you see. A remaster is a recreation of the master, made to meet higher technical standards than those that existed at the time of the original master's creation. A great and relevant example would be the 2018 4K Ultra HD release of Lara Croft Tomb Raider. The film's original 1080p Blu-ray transfer from 2008 is terrible, at times barely looking higher resolution than its DVD counterpart. The 4K remaster is a tremendous upgrade, and was achieved by rescanning the original 35mm film at 4K and then completely regrading the film. The problem that video game remasters face is that there's no direct equivalent to this method in software development. A video game is not recorded on an analog or a digital medium. It's an interactive experience that runs in real time by re reading and executing complex instructions known as code. The only thing games share in common with music and film in this regard is that their masters are static, meaning that they're confined to the technical standards of their time until there's an effort to update them for compatibility with modern hardware. Where games differ is that the process of remastering them also requires their code to be updated, and that brings us to something that most people don't realize about remasters of games. There's a common misconception that remasters are purely visual. That's never true. Almost all video game remasters are, at their core, ports. Whether they be ports to updated versions of their respective engines, ports to entirely new engines, or ports to different platforms, remastering a game usually starts by porting it or its engine to the newest infrastructure available so it can run on modern devices. But let's stop for a second to ask an important question. Why are these ports even necessary? Didn't we have technology back in the day that allowed us to play old games on new hardware without having to explicitly port games? The answer is yes. The technology that lets us play games from previous generations on current hardware is formally known as backwards compatibility. If you've been gaming for long enough, you definitely remember a time where all major consoles, those being the Nintendo Wii, the Xbox 360, and the PlayStation 3, featured backwards compatibility. So what happened? Why don't we just have universal backwards compatibility today so that we don't need ports of old games or remasters? The answer to that is a bit complex. You see, back during 7th gen, consoles only had to be backwards compatible with two generations of 3D games at most, and even that was a feature unique to the first PlayStation 3 model. The Wii couldn't play Nintendo 64 games, and though it did have backwards compatibility with the GameCube, this functionality was removed in later revisions of the console. The same thing happened to the PlayStation 3's ability to play PlayStation 2 games. These hardware decisions by Nintendo and Sony during 7th gen left backwards compatibility in an already shaky state that would only get worse in 8th gen. At the start of 8th gen, the Xbox One shipped without backwards compatibility, and while the Wii U could play Wii games, the PlayStation 4 couldn't play PlayStation 3 games at all. The PlayStation 4 in particular is vital to this discussion because given the PlayStation 3's internal cell architecture, it's very likely that the reason the PlayStation 4 had no backwards compatibility with the PlayStation 3 is because it simply wasn't powerful enough. But hold on, you might be saying. It's the PlayStation 4 
why couldn't it run PlayStation 3 games? This question encapsulates one of the main issues with backwards compatibility. Historically, backwards compatibility has been achieved on consoles by integrating hardware from the past generation system in the new one, but it can also be done through software with emulation, which is best demonstrated by Xbox. In 2015, Xbox launched the Xbox One backwards compatibility program. Using both hardware and software solutions, the Xbox One was able to emulate select Xbox 360 and Xbox titles. The key word there is select. If you've ever used an emulator, you know that they've got an enormous number of options you can enable or disable to get certain games to work. You also probably know that not all games can be emulated optimally, no matter their age. Xbox's efforts were incredibly commendable, but what they effectively did with their backwards compatibility program was curate a list of games that their hardware could emulate. They did extensive testing to make sure that select titles worked, but not all of them would, likely due to case-by-case -case incompatibilities with the Xbox One V GPU that allowed this process to work. Consoles are an enticing product for consumers because of their price and ease of use. They guarantee that games will just work. The reason we don't have universal backwards compatibility is because it requires console manufacturers to either include hardware from a previous console in their new one, which boosts the cost of manufacturing the console, or figure out how to emulate the previous generation through software, which isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Because this can be a headache to figure out, console manufacturers don't see consistent backwards compatibility across all of their previous platforms as a priority, and tend to only go through the trouble for the immediate last generation. Even then, there can be issues, and that's why Xbox curated the games for their program to make sure they just work. Emulation is also only possible when the new hardware has enough power to emulate old games. For the PlayStation 3 specifically, its games were created in such a way that emulating them is still challenging for computers today that are much stronger than the PlayStation 4. This problem wiped out backwards compatibility for Sony for an entire generation. For publishers, the inconsistency of backwards compatibility across 8th gen consoles was almost certainly a nightmare, because they had little to no way to make sure their libraries would be playable on the new consoles. Sony made it outright impossible, Nintendo had a failing console, and Xbox chose all of the games for their backwards compatibility program internally, not at the request of publishers. Because console manufacturers couldn't guarantee that over eight years worth of back catalogs would be playable on their new hardware, publishers had to do it themselves, by individually porting games, and that brings us right back to remasters. Today, ports and remasters are almost synonymous. It's rare to get a port that doesn't feature some level of graphical enhancement, and now it's time to explore how developers create these enhanced versions, and why they typically go for remasters instead of one-to-one -one ports when they re-release games. Every game is unique. How a developer approaches modernizing one typically depends on how it was constructed in the first place. For some, porting the game is the immediate and obvious answer. For others, work can be done on modernizing the engine instead. A great example of this is Bioshock Remastered. Instead of porting the game, Unreal Engine 2.5 itself was rewritten to take advantage of modern 64-bit architecture. It's possible that these methods were chosen as porting the game from Unreal Engine 2.5 to 4 was deemed unfeasible by developer Blind Squirrel Games. A game's age is also usually a key factor in the developer's initial assessment of how to bring it to new hardware. Depending on its age, it may feature commonalities with modern game engines which could make the process easier, or it could contain several incompatibilities that would make the process harder. It's for this reason that it's crucial for developers to have access to a game's source code. Source code is all of the original instructions written for a program, and it informs developers working on ports and remasters how every technical aspect of a game works internally. So when they encounter incompatibilities during porting, they can reference the source code in order to understand the reason for the incompatibility and how to accurately fix it. Now, while it is very helpful to have source code while remastering, it's not the solution to every problem. For example, 
During the development of Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered, Raven Software faced a number of problems as they ported the game to the newest version of the Call of Duty engine at that time. Despite having the original game's source code, many art elements such as models and animations didn't translate to the new engine, and that was likely due to the inner workings of modern day graphics. From 2015 to 2016, gaming saw its first group of games released using physically based rendering, a collection of modern rendering methods and techniques. What physically based rendering allows games to do is accurately simulate how light interacts with materials using unique texture maps. These texture maps store information that tells light how to behave, which makes it easier to achieve photorealism. Since 2016, PBR workflows have been implemented by every modern engine used for AAA development. The issue is that PBR conflicts directly with old methods used to convey lighting on objects. Physically based materials didn't exist in games until 2013, which meant that for basically all of 7th gen, developers had to approximate specularity, or how light shines on an object. This created a wild west of different methods and interpretations unique to each development studio concerning how light would look on different materials. And because these methods were just approximations, they could make materials like metal look very glossy and inaccurate, which is a stark contrast from today where materials across all engines are physically based. It's worth noting that PBR is an approach to visuals that works best with modern polygon counts. If an asset doesn't have enough polygons to portray certain details, the usage of PBR could make that asset look out of place with the rest of the photorealistic environment, even if a game has a stylized aesthetic. The problem that I believe Raven Software ran into with Modern Warfare Remastered's visuals is that the original assets were too low poly and used texture workflows that were no longer supported by the Call of Duty engine and its PBR pipeline. When a game is ported to a new version of an engine, it has to follow all of that new engine's rules, and PBR is just one of many modern techniques that make old assets look visually inconsistent. You can see an extreme case of this in Rise of the Tomb Raider, where you can select Lara Croft's classic outfits and they contrast a little with the surrounding modern visuals. Today, engines do lighting, shadows, and post-processing in completely different ways than how they used to 15 years ago. Most of the time, when you port an old game to a new engine, the effects that made up the original game's presentation no longer exist, as they've all been replaced by modern iterations of those techniques. And this is the reason that developers tend to go for remasters rather than ports for re-releases. It's easier and more enticing to remake old assets that fit in with modern visuals and systems than it is to recreate old visual effects and pipelines from scratch. This can be seen in Saints Row the Third Remastered, where developer Sparasoft remade character models, weapons, and vehicles to fit with the new visuals and lighting engine they implemented. It can also be seen in Life is Strange Remastered, where all of the central characters have new models, likely to accommodate for visual consistency and new motion capture and effects possible with the game's port from Unreal Engine 3 to Unreal Engine 4. Even with examples where a game isn't ported to an engine with new pipelines, developers still remake assets to bring them up to modern visual standards. For Bioshock Remastered, character models, weapons, and certain level assets were remade to really sell the feeling of an updated experience. This is why I said that you'd be half right if you guessed money as the reason for why there are so many remasters today. We'll talk about the financial side of things in a minute, but updating the way a game looks is just something natural that happens as technology evolves, and the desire from developers to update a game's visuals isn't new at all. Remasters have been around forever, and there's no better example of this than 1993's Super Mario All-Stars. All-Stars was originally conceived as a way to get the Famicom's Mario games on the Super Famicom as a value deal. The graphics data from the original Famicom titles was lost, so the team behind All-Stars was tasked with a complete graphical overhaul of the games, which was possible then because of the Super Famicom's 16-bit design. It's worth noting that the All-Stars team also had the option to remake Mario's movement and alter the placement of enemies 
but decided not to touch any gameplay because it would have created an experience different from the original games. All Stars is one of the industry's earliest examples of a remaster done right, and while that's obviously due in large part to the excellent work from the team working on it, it's also because Nintendo as a whole cared about the product they were creating. It's impossible to talk about how video game remasters are made without addressing how important it is that developers are set up for success by their publishers. Remasters are like any other game project. There may be less risk associated with them, but that doesn't mean they aren't budgeted, staffed, and worked on like other games. This means that the quality and overall success of a remaster is still largely tied to how much support it receives from its publisher. When a publisher is fully behind a project, developers are enabled and can do their jobs properly. But when a publisher has low standards and doesn't care, you can get something disastrous that isn't worth anyone's time and money. Developers work with the resources they're given by publishers, and poor remasters are almost always the result of inadequate funding and or unreasonable deadlines. I find it obscene that publishers with more money than God still release subpar ports and remasters. As a community, we should demand better from the people with the money. Developers are not infallible. They can make mistakes, but if they're set up to fail, they will. And that's a scenario where neither the developer nor the consumer are happy with the resulting product. Remasters come in all shapes and sizes, and not every remaster is going to look like a brand new game. But they should all still demonstrate respect for both the work of the developer and the hard-earned money someone is willing to spend on the final product. Before I go, I'd like to ask one last question, and this one's a bit more philosophical. Why do we care about remasters? What is it about the idea of re-experiencing something that's so valuable to us? We play games at all different times of our lives, and while the games are important, I think what they make us feel and the things going on in our lives when we play them all help form the experiences that we remember for years. Remasters give us the unique opportunity to revisit games from two new perspectives. There's the updated game, but there's also the updated us. Much like games themselves, where you're able to analyze the mistakes you make and grow from them to progress, your experience with a remaster will undoubtedly have you looking back at your own past and when you played that game originally. I hope that for everyone, there's a bigger and wiser person playing now than there was back then. Thanks for watching.